pleasure to introduce today Professor Danny Kua of the London School of Economics. Danny is the Kuwait Professor of Economics and International Development and Senior Fellow at LSE Ideas, among numerous other titles that he holds. He was appointed to Malaysia's National Economic Advisory Council from 2009 to 2011, after serving as head of the Department of Economics at LSE from 2009, 6 to 2009. He is a specialist in macroeconomics and econometrics. He works on the global economy, growth and development, inequality, and international economic relations. Professor Kwa holds degrees from Princeton and Harvard, and has taught at MIT before moving to the LSE. In addition, he has been visiting professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing, at NTU, and now at NUS as the Tan Chin Tuan visiting professor in the Department of Economics. If I was to share with you his entire CV, we would not get a chance to hear his lecture. So let me highlight only some of the important uh, events that he's been a part of before turning it over to him for his remarks this evening. Professor Kwa delivered the inaugural LSE Big Questions Lecture on the theme of East Beats West in 2011. That same year, he gave the Confucius Institute for Business London Annual Public Lecture, uh, gave the public lecture, with the provocative title, 627 million Chinese lifted out of poverty, where did it go wrong? As well as, in the same year, the 8th SER Distinguished Public Lecture here in Singapore. In 2009, he was part of a public debate that I would have loved to attend, where he, along with Lord Charles Powell, Sir David Tang, went up against Gulcharan Das, Deepak Lal, and Mark Tully on the burning question of, quote, the future belongs to India, not China, at, the, at London's Royal Geographical Society. By way, of introducing the issue, by way of introducing the issues his talk is concerned with, let me quote Danny from a recent article addressed to the Chinese leadership regarding what George Bush Sr. called, used to call, that vision thing. Quote, what China's leadership seems not to fully grasp is that the world, is what the world wants from China is not only peaceful rise, but global leadership. In the eyes of the world, the opposite of peaceful rise is not dominating hegemony, but responsible stakeholder. Convince the world, he's telling the Chinese leadership, that your vision is credible of a peaceful growing world economy, free from global hegemony, open to trade, that will benefit all rich and poor worldwide. To know what these words mean today, leadership, hegemony, stakeholder, and to flag the key words from the title of today's lecture, managing, no one's world, and in whose interests, we must turn to today's speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Denny Kwan. Thank you very much for that very generous and uh, warm introduction and welcome. Um, what I want to talk about this evening, what I want to get your views on, is as just announced this topic of managing no one's world, which feeds from the, in the kind introduction, a reference to an article that I wrote recently for the Chinese press on what the world expects of China's leadership. Today, what I want to do is to look at the question more broadly, managing no one's world. And that is a reference to how the world has changed from where it used to be clearly identified as a Western world or an American world or the US century to yet something else. So in managing the world, really the question that I pose here is how we should manage the global economy. Immediately, someone might say, what kind of a question is that? That's not for us to answer. That's for the rest of the world to address. We, Singaporean nation, Singaporeans, we're part of the global economy, and we don't really have to address a question that includes us as possible managers of the global economy. Of course, what I mean by how we should manage the global economy is not that literally. As an academic, I have even less influence on world affairs um, than you know, the people of a thriving first world nation comprised of close to five million people like myself. But as an academic, what I want to, us to discuss this evening that addresses this question 
is a task that we can undertake, that all of us can undertake. That our job is that we need to identify what the large challenges and trade-offs are in managing the global economy. And those tasks, that task, identifying the challenges and trade-offs is exactly what the intellectuals and scholars in every society is supposed to undertake. So the response to this rather presumptuous title of managing the world economy, one that says, well, it's not actually my problem. It's someone else's problem. And why are you following me around anyway, pestering me with questions like this? Get out of my kitchen. There's an easy answer for most of us, whether we live in Singapore or Western Europe or anywhere else, what managing the world economy is. And that easy answer is this picture. This describes a view of the world that says there is the World Economic Center and there is a global leadership and it's centered on the United States of America. That's how it's been for the last 50, 75 years. That's how it's going to be for the next 50, 75 years. And the rest of the world simply fades into a different stereotypical characterization. America is where the action is. Now this map while it's intended to be provocative, of course also plugs into a stream of serious thinking, both intellectual and policy oriented. This serious thinking is characterized by, among other people, economic historians like Peter Tannen and David Vines, who have recently completed a book called The Leaderless World, where they identify how the problems that the world is in comes from exactly the failure of this picture to continue to describe this world. According to Tevin and Vines, one of the reasons that we went into the global financial crisis, and one of the reasons that it's been so difficult for us to recover, we, the world, recover from the global financial crisis, is that the United States has seen diminished influence. The United States is no longer the clear, uncontroversial, universally acknowledged leader of the world, and there's a lack of success on the world stage. In the letter that was described to you earlier, I referred to how some other source of global leadership might want to take the stage. Whether that's China or actually somebody else remains to be seen. But for the time being, that scholars who are plugged into the historical thinking, the understanding of how global society and the world economy behaves, would be represented by the kind of thinking that you see described here. So when no country can act as a hegemon, the world crisis arrives. This is a strand of thinking that goes back decades, in fact, if not centuries, not articulated in exactly this economic historian way. Now, a consequence of this kind of thinking is something that Barry Eichen Green and co-author Brad DeLong recently said. They describe what the world needs in terms of not just managing the global economy, but actually just running, making sure the world is a safe place is that the United States needs to reassume the power and the responsibility and the burden of sacrifice that it carried most of the 20th century. It was a benevolent global hegemon, and that's what we need to restore. Many observers, many scholars, many intellectuals yearn for a return to that stable kind of world, a world where this global hegemon was the United States, did run the world, wrote the rules of engagement for all different countries and made sure global financial stability characterized the world. There are two assumptions that are carried along in this way of thinking. The first of these assumptions is that the United States actually has the capacity and the capability and the power to reassume that role of global hegemony. That is debatable. You and I can look at some of the evidence on that. The second perhaps even more important assumption in this line of thinking is that the global hegemon will do the right thing for the world. That it's okay that it's be just the United States that's global hegemon. We are just one. It's not a committee that's going to run the world. But this global hegemon not only has the capacity and the capability to run the world, it will do the right thing. The actions that it undertakes, the rules of engagement that it writes down, the role of police officer that it takes on when it roams the world, it ends up doing the right thing 
for the welfare of humanity. So there are two assumptions. One, capacity. Second, what economists might identify as an alignment of incentives. And the United States, the global gentleman, will do the right thing. Now, of course, no country goes around the world thinking, what is it that I should do for the world that will benefit the world? What countries do, what policymakers do, is they go around thinking, what can I do for my people? What can I do that benefits me? And the alignment of incentives problem that an economist might identify here is to raise the possibility that we're moving into a world where these incentives are no longer perfectly aligned, where what the United States wants is no longer what is good for the majority of humanity. And part of this rewiring of the global landscape comes from something that appears in the synopsis of this talk. That's the possibility that this, the world has changed. And it has changed so that even though these writers, Barry Icon Green, who's a frequent visitor to Asia, comes to NUS quite frequently, or Peter Temin and David Vines, all of whom uh, serious scholars, knowledgeable, thoughtful, writing just this year. Where what seems to be missing in this thinking is an acknowledgement that something has changed. Now, depending on what part of the global economy we sit in, some of this might be more obvious to us than to others. So I want to pose the question, is there a great, has there been a profound change in the way the global economy functions and operates? And does that profound change reflect on these proposals for a return of the world to a global agenda? Has there been, and to make this concrete, I want to propose the hypothesis that the way the world has changed is a great shift in place. That the way the distribution, if you want to think about it in technical economist terms, the way the spatial distribution of economic activity the configuration of the locus of production and consumption, the way that has shifted is a movement of that distribution towards the eastern side of our planet. The eastern side of our planet when viewed from the Greenwich Meridian, from zero meridian. And when I say that some of this will be more obvious to others than to others, well, let's look at an example of this. Kishore Mahubani is the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, just down the road, in Tima campus. He and I have constant conversations about the nature of this change in the world. Recently, as you will know, he has been writing considerable amounts on how the Great Shift East has already occurred. It is real, it is sustained. We're moving into the new Asian century, the new Asian hemisphere. And the, United, and the way many Western observers interpret what Kishore says is described by the CNN headline, Wake up America, you're falling behind. The global economy has shifted, and if the United States is to reassume its police, world police officer beneficial role as global hegemon, it needs to repair that. It should not be something that falls behind. Now, if we live in this part of the world, or if you live in Silicon Valley, California, or you live in certain parts of the European Union, this will seem to you as already blatantly obvious. There ought to be no discussion about whether the great shift East has occurred. We should just spend the rest of this hour talking about the implications of that. But I want to suggest that actually, it is not that clear to many other people. In yesterday's Financial Times, Martin Wolf wrote yet another article talking about why China's economy, one of the poles of this great shift East, will not continue. Hong Kong speed dating sites constantly describe possible marital situations where, although it is only implicit, the idea is East Asian Hong Kong women will get to meet Western men and they will do that at the price of here of 480 Hong Kong dollars, whereas men can come into these kinds of meetings for free. Now these are two extreme examples, one obviously relatively lighthearted, the other quite a lot more serious, but how in fact the great shift is, is not real, it is not sustained, it is not something that's actually occurred. And so, you and I, as intellectuals, as scholars, and people who are interested in policy, you and I need to go back and look at the evidence. What does the evidence say about what the great, whether a great shift east has occurred? Or is it, in fact, simply something that investment bankers use so that they can get your funds 
to invest in emerging markets and make money at the same time. What is the reality of this possible big shift east? Now, what I've just gone through tells us, I hope, makes clear to us what the significance of this question is, the significance of addressing this question. It has to do not just with people who are trying to decide where to put their pension portfolios. It has to do with how we govern the world, how the, we govern the global economy. And we believe the way economic historians and observers like Gary Hagen Green and others write about the global economy, until we figure that out, this is going to be a global economy that will continue to be unstable, beset with global financial crisis of the kind that we just saw in 2008, and from which in Western Europe and the United Kingdom we have not yet recovered. What is the evidence of whether a great shift east has occurred in the global economy? When we talk about this question, when I try and think about this question and think about what it means to do economic research, to ask, has a great shift east occurred? in the global economy. This is the first picture I think about. This is a picture of the global economy. When we study the global economy, this is it. This is where the action is. This is the satellite map of the Earth, taken at night. It shows lights lighting up the nighttime sky. The reason that economists, social scientists, people who are interested in global policy might want to look at a picture like this is that these lights tell us where people live and where people play. And at this kind of global dimension, where people live and play is where they work. Where they work is where they create value, where they generate wealth, and where a polity forms for just thinking about how global governance needs to emerge. And in this picture, the most striking thing about this picture probably is the concentration of lights on the transatlantic axis. That is where 70% of global economic activity as described by these lines occurs. Imagine a line running down the middle of the, trunk of the Atlantic Ocean. 50% of the lights pretty much show up there on the eastern seaboard of the United States. 50% of the lights show up in Western Europe. And then the rest of the world is pretty much dark. Yes, Africa has 700 million people, but look, it's pretty much just nothing as far as the nighttime sky is concerned. I have good friends in Australia, Chairman of the Economics Department is originally from New Zealand, but I'm sorry, you just cannot identify economic activity occurring in Australia and New Zealand. Now, this is, you and I know the reality on the ground. The reality on the ground is lots of interesting things happen in Africa, chunks of the Gulf Peninsula, parts of Latin America, Australia, Australasia, Indonesia. The point isn't whether you and I can find or identify economic activity that occurs there. The point is that on a global scale, what this picture tells us is that most of the world's economic activity is still firmly on the transatlantic axis. Now there's a problem with this picture. The obvious problem is that this picture obviously distorts reality. There is no point in time when all of the world is dark. So this is a little bit of a white lie in this picture. Obviously, this picture is the composite put together from NASA satellites that encircle the Earth. They will go around on the Earth's equator and take photographs of Earth at night so that they can, physicists can understand what's happening with luminosity over the nighttime sky. But what you and I are interested in is trying to take this picture and tell an economic story about it. Understand the evolution of the global economy. Use this to reflect on statements that scholars are making about the nature of global governance. Now, what you and I would like to do is to take this picture and understand, unpack more of the details here. The second thing, the first thing that's wrong with this picture is that it's obviously a lie. It can't be a satellite photograph taken at any one instant. The second thing that's wrong with this picture is that this picture was taken 30 years ago. This is a picture of the planet's economic activity in 1980 not in 2013. We don't anymore have NASA satellites and Earth taking these kinds of photographs. Instead, we have to do something else. So what I did was I did a poor man's approximation to NASA satellites. I went to Google Earth and I asked it to inspect the Earth's surface and then I cross-tabulated that with data from the World Bank World Development Indicator. And with that, you can match how GDP, economic value, is being generated in these different parts of the planet. What you end up with is identifying 700 spots on Earth where there's appreciable economic activity of any kind. What these 700 spots on Earth allow us to do is that it allows us to understand 
how the global economy is shifting, how the global economy is changing. But to do that, of course, we don't have the nice luminosity, and we would like to be a little bit more precise. Economists like to be precise. We don't like to just look at pictures and graphs. We like to look, up, look at equations or look at numbers. Well, here is the equations version of this picture. The equations version of this picture comes from tabulating these 700 points on Earth where economic activity can be measured, and then calculating the center of gravity of these 700 points on Earth, where that then describes the weighted average or the mean of economic activity, the spatial mean of economic activity. And to no one's surprise, the world's center of gravity in 1980, the same time, same year that that satellite photograph was taken, turns out to be exactly that point, or a point that looks like that point when you stare at it from one of NASA's satellites. That point sits firmly on the transatlantic axis. It's about halfway between the landmass of North America and Western Europe. It is pulled a little bit off of the 50 halfway point because of the economic activity that previously you could already detect from Japan and the eastern seaboard of China. It's pulled a little bit eastwards of that, but nonetheless, it is deep set in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's hundreds of kilometers west of London. It is off of Africa. This was the state of the world in 1980. This is the state of the world that that NASA satellite photograph described. What we now have are the tools from looking at equations, looking at numbers, tracking where world GDP has evolved to see how this has changed. And this is how it has changed. If we allow the animation to run so that we track these 700 plus points on Earth where economic growth is occurring, cities are producing value, investment bankers in New York, at least up until 2008, were generating wealth, and allow this center of gravity to evolve, this is what it looks like at three-year intervals. It begins as a sequence of dark dogs in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and then it tracks eastwards. It doesn't track it monotonically, it doesn't constantly just move eastwards. Every now and then, there's a disruption to global economic activity, the east slows, the west has a particular burst of, of entrepreneurial activity, and the center of gravity is pulled back to the west. So as you see this, there are times when it pulls back to the west, or its movement slows down. Freeze this picture. The sequence of black dots show history that has already occurred. The sequence of black dots is the history of the global economy between 1980 2010. The last black dot happens to be that point overlaid by the red dot. The red dot shows a little bit of a whimsical, light-hearted projection that takes forward the dynamics of GDP growth in these different points on Earth, and then says, let it run. Notice a few things about this. It looks like it's just moving linearly. It's not. Because the way this picture is put together isn't, doesn't just come from taking a ruler and then drawing a straight line through all of these points. It's saying that these 700 places on Earth, 700 locations on Earth evolve in a way that is respectful of what economists think of as growth theory, and then allow that to run forwards. What we see happening is that this running forwards continues or extrapolates the dynamic, but it doesn't extrapolate it in a linear way. Towards the end of the cycle that goes up to 2050, the sequence of dots slows down. It begins to cluster. It doesn't, like in a linear way, shoot off into the Pacific Ocean. Of course, it's sensible then it starts to cluster. But what's interesting there is that it starts to cluster on the boundary between India and China. It starts to cluster in the same time zone that Singapore happens to be. So if you draw the longitude, it cuts through pretty much a line between Penang Island and Singapore. So the statement that was made recently in the Wall Street Journal about how the world center of gravity is converging in towards Singapore reflects how this dynamic is taking us towards this part of the planet. Now, now there are technical things to say about this that I'm happy to get into if we were doing a technical uh, seminar. You know, how exactly is this thing calculated? Isn't this eastwards movement simply an artifact of looking at the Earth from this point in outer space? We looked at it from the other side of this. We looked at it from the Pacific Ocean side. This would look like a westwards movement of the world center of gravity. I don't want to get into that kind of discussion. It just doesn't go anywhere. I'm happy to have that kind of technical discussion. What this does is it tracks the world's economic. Imagine yourself on a satellite tracking the world's center of gravity 
track it, and this is how it appears on the surface of the planet. So our first piece of empirical evidence, how has the world changed? Well, gosh, it has changed quite a lot. The world's center of gravity has moved 5,000 kilometers in the last two decades. For most of the 20th century, the world's center of gravity sat firmly in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, to be clear, the world's center of gravity, or the world's economic center, is not necessarily where the greatest amount of economic activity occurs. Obviously, in the 1980s, when this was on the transatlantic axis, not much economic activity going on there. There were a few American submarines going by, a few Russian nuclear subs going in the other direction, playing cat and mouse with each other. Not very much else by way of economic activity. Economic activity was where? It was in London and New York. And what the 50% distance revealed was a trade-off between these two clusters of economic activity. So what we're seeing here in terms of the world's economic center is simply a tendency. It shows a tendency for the world's distribution, spatial distribution of economic activity to be moving eastwards. The construction of the great global supply chain of manufacturing concentrated in Asia. The rise of economies like China, Australia, India, all of that is working to pull the world's center of gravity east. So if I were speaking to the authors who are asking for a restoration of global hegemony back with the United States, I might pose the question, your view of the world seems reasonable when the world's economic center was roughly speaking aligned with the world's political center. When the world's economic center was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it was pretty close to Washington DC and London. And it makes sense then for you to think about the global hegemony centered on the United States. But look, the fact of the matter is, it is already history over the last 30 years that the world's economic center is now in Saudi Arabia. It is in the Gulf. It is at more 5,000 kilometers from where it used to be. And if these projections are reasonable, within our lifetime, it will be located closer to Singapore than to Washington, D.C. The world's economic center will be 10 time zones away from the world's political center. Shouldn't that make you rethink whether the restoration of global hegemony from the perspective of the United States is still the right policy? Should it make you rethink whether the United States will continue to have the capacity to run the world? Okay, this is not a statement that the United States will become poor, far from it. In these calculations, by 2050, the U.S. economy will have its, per, its average citizen three times richer than what he or she is today. The Americans will still be hugely rich. It's simply saying that there is a reorienting global balance of economic power. Okay, at this point, it might be reasonable for someone to say, look, you've done this, I believe the black dots. The black dots are already history, I'm not going to dispute that. But the red dots, well, that's just whimsy. What's going to happen is that the world will turn around. Asia, the East, doesn't have the sustained purchasing power of domestic consumption and anyway. It doesn't have the right structures of institutional governance. It's rife with corruption and bureaucracy. It doesn't have, across most of its nation states, the right governance structures of open ballot box democracy, which, for instance, in the hands of uh, our researchers like Daryl Nassimoglu and James Robinson, suggest that that is the kind of structure that will, you will need to be running the world. And not only that, but that's the kind of structure that you will need to allow prosperity to be sustained. So fine, you've shown me that this historical reality has occurred. But what is more interesting is what will happen in the future, what the collection of red dots have indicated. So if we're going to have a reasonable discussion that contends that global hegemony does not anymore belong in the United States, you and I need to be convinced that the collection of red dots here is not completely whimsical. And the way to do that is to step away from what's happening with gross domestic product economic value now and look at other things that are going on now. We spent a lot of time looking at all different dimensions. I'm going to just take two before I go to the next part of the talk. The first of these that I'm going to pick up is, well, as this is changing, is this, is this growth only benefiting a thin veneer of economic elites in Asia? Is it the case that as economic power is shifting in this way, actually it's again the elites in Asia that are benefiting from this, and most of Asia is actually being left behind?
that's the case, then there's no broad-based case to be made for how Asia or some other part of the world would need to rethink global governance. Let's check out what that looks like. This is a picture of that maps world growth and poverty. On the vertical axis, it shows what's happening to the number of people measured in millions of people, millions uh, who are living in extreme poverty, less than a dollar a day. On the horizontal axis, what it shows is per capita income of different countries or different country groupings. There's a lot of detail in here, but there are three variables that are of interest to us as we try and think about the broad-based sustainable <coughs> shift in the world's economic center of gravity. The three are, first of all, what's happening to poverty, to extreme poverty. Second is what's happening to per capita income. And the third is the size of these bubbles, what's happening to the population of each of these groupings. So the size of each bubble here represents the relative size of, for instance, China. China appears in 1981 as by far the largest sphere. It is comparable in size only to India, but India obviously had a smaller population at that time. The other things you might want to notice about this picture is that India, although its horizontal displacement is not huge, it is still twice that of China's. India's average citizen in 1981 was at double the income of the average citizen in China. And then when you look at it in the other dimension, looking at it vertically, the location of each bubble tells us how many millions of people lived in a dollar a day poverty. And we see that China being high up in this scale meant that in this picture, it had 835 million people, 90% of its population living on less than a dollar a day in 1981. Now, if you and I want to have a discussion about whether this change in the global economy is broad-based, sustained, what we need to be able to see in this picture, at this global scale, something that profoundly changes the land, the, 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 the map, the landscape of global poverty relative to 1981. So here's what happened. This animation once again shows at three-year intervals what's happening to global poverty and per capita income in different parts of the world. We already know some of these facts, but let's rehearse what's going on here. China, you would want to keep your eye on, that's the bright blue bubble. Notice that it moves downwards sharply in this picture. It starts from the northwest here, and then by the end of this period, it ends up in the middle of the pack but lower down, indicating that it has dramatically reduced poverty. Of the 835 million that began this period in less than a dollar, less than a, day, a dollar a day poverty, by the end of the sample, there were only 208 million living in a dollar a day poverty. Now, 208 million people still sounds like a large number. Heck, that's still quite a bit larger than all of Singapore. That's, that's half the size of the United States, half the size of Western Europe. It's about three times the size of the United Kingdom. So by the end of the sample, China still had a lot of people living in extreme poverty, but hey, you know what it did? Was it reduced that by 627 million. So from an initial, from an initial situation, where China had close to 90% of its population living on less than a dollar a day, it, along with other Eastern, East Asian nations, have dramatically changed their poverty profile. So by the end of this sample, this is how the world looked. China has moved from way up as an outlier in the cluster to being in the middle of the pack, really, as far as per capita income is concerned, average income. Despite China being the world's number two economy now, its average income is still relatively low. Its average income today is less than the average income of nine countries in Africa. It is still a poor, underdeveloped economy, despite its being the world's number two economy. But this picture shows that in the process of doing that, it dramatically reduced poverty. What's interesting here, not something that I'm going to make a big deal of, but I will come back to later on, is you'll notice what's happened to India over this same historical episode. India began with twice the per capita income and half the number of extremely poor people. By the end of the sample, India had half their per capita income and double the number of extremely poor than in China. East Asia did rise, but it didn't rise homogeneously or uniformly. And actually, as far as world poverty is concerned, pretty much India and China is the whole story. Everything else is small potatoes. Yes, there's Latin and Central America, and I know dependency theorists write a lot about what's happening with inequality and poverty in Latin and Central America, but compared to 
what was happening in China, India, what's happening in East Asia, that is really small potatoes as far as, as, far as this global change is concerned. Remember, it's that global perspective we need to be mindful of. Now, I want to be finishing up this discussion on empirical evidence and then get into more substantive meaty policy issues, but I can't leave without talking about trade. Because as most of us are looking at this picture, we say, yeah, I have, you know, there's all this going on. But of course, you know, we know why this is going on. We know what the rise of East Asia is. We know what the rise of China is about. What it is, is that East, the East is being allowed to grow because the West consumes. The East is growing because it's basically outsourced manufacturing from economic value that the West continues to want to consume. And so all that we're seeing here is not really organic, sustained growth from the Eastern side of our global economy. What it is, is an outsourcing of the manufacture of refrigerators and air conditioners and shoes and trainers away from where it would have happened along the transatlantic axis to the East Asian side of the planet. And so everything that we're just describing here is artificial and contrived because really what really describes the world is a big vector of trade where exports start in the eastern side of our planet and shoot off to the western side of our planet and because the west consumes the east is allowed to be dragged along with it and this is dragging along this failure of decoupling that's showing that this world center of gravity move is showing. Well, surprise, that's actually not the case. Um, this first item shows what's happening to the pattern of exports emerging from Singapore. So the dominant green line that shows up here is where Singapore's largest export market is. Singapore's largest export market now is developing Asia. It used to be, not so long ago, that if you added the United States and the European Union, the red line and the blue line here, the transatlantic axis, where all the bright lights were the dominant entity. That was Singapore's dominant export market. Singapore, like all other East Asian economies, was a big vector of exports from Singapore westwards towards the transatlantic axis. But we realized that's an outdated view of the world. Actually, when you go and look at the facts, the facts are that most of Singapore's exports are actually East, actually to the rest of developing Asia. But wait, isn't this just an artifact of how Singapore has a particular industrial landscape? What it does is it provides inputs into China's production, Taiwanese production, and that is still the big arrow that heads uh, west. And so really, all that this is, is breaking down the global supply chain, and we still don't understand, we still can't figure out whether growth is sustainable we would like, it would be nice if we had data to break that down. We don't, but what we can do is try and think about how widespread this pattern of trade is. So let's look around the world. Here it is Kuwait. Kuwait similarly shows an explosion of trade away from when it was the transatlantic axis that dominated Kuwait's export markets to now developing Asia. Developing Asia now imports from Kuwait between five to six times what the United States or the European Union but again, maybe this is just, well, this is, you know, Kuwait is on the western side of Asia. So again, this is just the big arrow of trade going west. Well, let's look around the world some more. Here's Germany. Germany shows very visibly, you know, outside of Germany's export trading partners in the European Union, in, in the Eurozone, Germany shows very visibly how the blue line, the United States, was Germany's major export market outside the European Union, far and away. China, developing Asia, didn't really figure. But then look what's happened. Not just most recently following the 2008 global financial crisis, but in the run-up to that. Yes, it is true that in the run-up, in, in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis, Germany's exports to developing Asia overtook Germany's exports to the United States. And for some of us, well, that's simply because of the collapse of the United States as an export market as U.S. consumers deleveraged. And U.S. consumers you know, were beset by the global, the global financial crisis hit there harder than it did elsewhere. So that, of course, is why Germany now seems to export more to developing Asia than it does to the United States, simply because of this cyclical collapse. But hey, of course, when you look at this picture, rather than just look at the numbers, you realize that for developing Asia to have done that, 
the aftermath of the global financial crisis, it must have already been close to doing that before 2008. And indeed, in the run-up to the 2008 global financial crisis, the size of Germany's exports to developing Asia had accelerated well <coughs> before the global financial crisis itself. And when you expand this to the European Union as a whole, it is interesting to remember that the European Union as a whole, despite what the, the architects of you know, further integration would like us to think, is not a single, unified, well-behaved homogenous economy. It's made up of more and more painfully obvious, relative underperformance in the southern part of Europe, and relatively overperformance like Germany. But even for the European Union as a whole, the European Union already Will show already shows the United States not the EU's largest single export market, but instead developing Asia. So let's rejig our mind map of the world. Not only is the global center of gravity not on the transatlantic axis, not only is this growth in the East not just restricted to a thin veneer of elites, it is also the case that the patterns of global trade have turned around 180 degrees what we used to think of as the way the world worked, where the United States economy had a valid claim to be the world's police officer, because when the US economy sneezed, the rest of the world caught the cold, well, the world has changed dramatically in the last 30 years, at numbers on a scale visible from outer space. So we come away from this, maybe with a little bit more humility in understanding how, why the United States might continue to have a claim on being global heavy. Ah, okay, but what about the fact that growth is unsustainable? Fine, you've shown us some numbers that indicate that the growth that's occurring is a lot more broad-based, a lot more sustained than initially you might have thought. That the patterns of reorienting trade, well, okay, that's a bit of a surprise, but suppose I don't give up yet. Because after all, who else but Premier Wen Jiabao described growth in China? by extension growth in a lot of Asia, has been unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. Indeed, it is a common theme in the work of many Chinese economists and Chinese scholars that what's happening in East Asia, this shift in the world center of gravity, is actually not sustainable. It's come from an unbalanced, uncoordinated economy. And it's not something that will continue. And indeed, lots of writers, lots of economists have piled in on not just Martin Wolf writing the FT, uh, not just Muriel Rubini is talking to us about how the world is all good and good. Also, Barry Eichengreen, Darren Asimoglu, James Robinson, many authors have described how the East cannot show sustained growth. What are some of the reasons? Let's just pick five. There are actually multiple, and we could spend a lot of time trying to unpack them, but let's just pick five. The first of these is that what's happening in the East that's easy pickings. What's happening in the East is just simply people picking off low hanging fruit. It's the easy thing to do. In fact, China in 1981 had 835 million people living on less than less than a dollar a day. When your economy is so poor with so many people living in poverty, heck, all you have to do is wake up every morning, roll out of bed, and you have lifted another hundred million people out of poverty. It is easy pickings, doing the easy things, just doing low hanging fruit. The World Bank sometimes has this view of what's happening in East Asia. And it's just doing all the easy things. Asimoglu and Robinson and others pile in. The institutions in East Asia are wrong. There's no open democracy. It does not allow the fact that these systems, these political systems in the East, while it might have worked for the last 30 years, these systems are not flexible. They don't allow people to articulate their concerns. It does not allow people to feel legitimately part of this growth process. Fine, you've lifted 627 million people out of poverty. But until I can vote for who the leader is, I don't feel part of this process, and I am not able to convince the leadership of my country, of my region, to be flexible in how it approaches changing the patterns of entrepreneurial activity. Instead, Asimov and Robinson go on to say how the institutions are wrong, and what's happened is that we've seen the emergence of a class of extractive elites. So the princelings in China, the cronies in Malaysia, other, you know, uh, other elites throughout all of East Asia, what's allowed to happen because of, if only just the semblance of democracy, 
but still a rigid stratified political leadership is that these systems are inflexible, these extractive elites will do harm to the economy, and all of that we've seen last 30 years, that will turn around. And that's the second reason for why you might suspect to go along with Wen Jiabao and say growth in China and East Asia is unsustainable. The third reason is the Mark Zuckerberg reason. Many of you here are on Facebook. You know that Mark Zuckerberg some years back said, you know, one of the reasons Facebook works, young people on it, young people are just smart. Young people figure out how things work. They're entrepreneurial, they're energetic, they're what drives growth in an economy. And don't listen to me, I'm only the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. Go listen to scholars like David Bloom and other researchers who've run growth regressions. And what these people have uncovered is that there's a demographic dividend. Societies that show a relatively young population grow faster. Okay, they've even calibrated by how many percentage points a certain you know, increase in ratio will allow an economy to grow by. There's a demographic dividend. And what we see in East Asia is the opposite of that. People are growing old. The demography is growing old. China, the worst of these, because of its one-child policy, the age pyramid is structured in such a way that very soon you'll have so many more old people than young people. For some economic reasons, these people are not productive, they're not in the workforce, they're retired, they're a drain on the rest of society. Demographic division has vanished from the East. And the West continues to be able to have this because it's able to draw in young people from the rest of the world. Demographic dividend works in the opposite direction. Finally, let me finish up with two other reasons before we turn to the facts. China, one of the reasons that China and the rest of East Asia, and good gosh, Singapore, the reason that Singapore and China grew so fast, so quickly, is that they attempted to inject a lot of physical capital into the economy. China has a dangerous addiction to investment as an engine of growth. Investment GDP ratio in China is close to 50%, if not more. And no economy in all of human history has been able to sustain that. The reason China is growing so quickly is that its government is taking resources and building empty buildings and highways that go nowhere. All that adds up to GDP, but it's not sustainable. Very soon, all of this capital that the Chinese government has put in place will be unproductive, because people will not, there won't be enough people around to work for them. 15, 20 years ago, my colleagues at MIT at that time, Alvin Young and Paul Krugman, wrote several articles about how the nature of growth in Singapore the rest of East Asia was driven by the sweat of the labor and the extraction of surplus from this labor by the government to putting in place more and more capital. Another dangerous addiction to, invest, to investment as an engine of growth. And in the hands of Paul Krugman, in discussion of Krugman, what was going to happen in Singapore then is what the same thing has happened in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union too tried to grow through directed government control investment. The Soviet Union thought that by doing this, we could bury the West under the, f the wave of iron and steel production that its factories would produce. And in Krugman's interpretation, and almost everyone's interpretation, that did not materialize because the Soviet Union attempted to drive growth through state-directed investment, pushed it in the wrong direction, and the Soviet Union eventually dissolved. It is a, a fallacy and a dangerous addiction to investment that central planners, people pushing growth in not completely free economies think they can continue to engineer growth. And China is going to come prey to the same kind of problem. And then finally, while East Asia has been able to show the sustained growth that has over the 30 years, maybe there's still a lingering doubt in our minds that East Asia has actually decoupled from the West. The East has become, there might still be a failure to decouple. Now, you might remember, there was a time back when bankers and policymakers were optimistic about how the East could continue to grow because in their language, the East had decoupled from the West. If the West slowed down, the East would continue to grow. And then, in the run-up to the global financial crisis, many bankers, many policymakers began to reverse their views on that. They said actually what was going to happen is that if the West sees a crisis, the East will collapse because actually what there is is a failure to decouple. Now, there, these are five distinct reasons. 
They are related, but these are five distinct reasons why someone, despite all the good news that we've seen previously, might think okay, the East cannot continue. This is something that's bound to slow down. Let's once again look at the evidence on this. That I won't be able to go through point by point, but for those who are interested, you know, the, the, the things that, that are written on this. So let's go through this point by point. What's happening to the reasoning that, that you know, all that's happened is easy picking, it's no happening for Well, remember our China-India comparison? Where I said you know, India and China had reversed in levels of per capita GDP and poverty. Well, extracting from that dynamic into this picture, this blue line is exactly the same data as before, shows the transition of China from its high poverty, low income state in 1981 through a non-monotone path. There were reversals, but eventually to a relatively high or middle income, low poverty state. This is the transition path, the trajectory that China undertook over this period. What did India do? India did this. Over exactly the same time period, India moved this tiny horizontal distance. And if you stare at this picture hard enough, you notice that actually the trajectory that's India actually showed an increase in poverty. Despite India being this democracy that's supposed to be adaptable, take care of its people, the right institutions in the Asimov do all this type of analysis, well, what India actually did was that it grew so slowly with this population growth, actually there were more people living in poverty at the end of the cycle than there were at the beginning. Now, that's one point to make about the validity of the criticism that it's institutions of governance that are an important or sole determinant of economic outcomes. But the other thing to make here is that where were the easy pickings for India? If all that was happening was people rolling out of bed, doing the easy things, picking off low-hanging fruit. Heck, India had lots of low-hanging fruit then. And actually, it still has lots of low-hanging fruit now. India has not been able to capitalize from this advantage of being bad, advantage of lagging behind the leaders. In neoclassical growth theory, the technical term that we used to refer to this is convergence. The idea is that if you are if you are further behind, then you converge up faster. Well, India has failed to converge. Convergence is not automatic. It is not easy to get low-hanging fruit. Take the perspective that you know democratic institutions deliver broad-based consensus, deliver political legitimacy. These are the results of a survey undertaken by the Pew Foundation based in Washington, D.C across different countries. They go around different countries and they ask people all kinds of questions. One of the questions they asked recently was, how satisfied are you with the direction that your country is going under the current leadership? How much do you approve of the way your country is going? How much uh, do you feel that you're coming along with everyone? Or do you feel that the elites are pulling away from you because they are extracting all of the wealth of your economy? So when these people, Washington-based think tank, goes around and surveys people in China, the surveys, the animal surveys in China since 2008 have shown an approval rating that's never been more than 85%. When the same question is asked of Americans in the United States, that approval rating is never higher than 36%. And indeed, in, 20, in 2011, it was only 21%. Okay, let's pause here in this headlong rush. Let's not all of a sudden just embrace, okay, it must be that Chinese communism is doing the right thing for its people. Because look, this is a survey. And in this survey, people answer what they wish to answer. There's no what economists think of as a market test for people actually doing the outcomes that actually reveal what they really feel. So maybe people in China who are saying, oh yeah, you know, you're, you're a, a nice gentleman with a clipboard and a pencil. You must be an official person. You're asking me how whether I approve of the government. You know, I don't really know you. You might be a front for the Chinese Communist Party. I better tell you what I think you want to hear. So maybe, maybe, that's why there's an approval rating of 85%. But on the other hand, I see no reservation of Chinese citizens or Chinese people are holding back when they criticize the government on Weibo, in newspapers, on the internet. There is no fear, despite the great firewalls, but censors constantly removing inflammatory comments. I have had comments removed from my Weibo within 10 seconds of my posting. These people are vigilant. There's no problem with people expressing what they think. So maybe we should shade this down. Maybe it's not 85%. Let's, let's be generous. Suppose it's 65%. Actually, the Chinese population, 65% approve of the direction the government's taking their country in the last five years. And suppose that you know Americans, they're answering this. Okay, they don't have faced the same problems that Chinese citizens do. But on the other hand, 
they're constantly moaning about the state of the world, they're bitching, it's you, they're used to complaining. So maybe, really, the approval rating is not really 36%. Let's shade it up by another 20%, which is 56%. But at the end of doing that adjustment, I am still China 65%, the United States 56%. They're within spitting distance of each other. There's no clear demarcation that across broad-based political systems with marked differences, the approval rating or the political legitimacy of the government or the broad-based nature of how the people approve of the direction the country is taking. Nothing here tells me that the, the Americans and Chinese are dramatically different, despite the 180 degree difference in systems of government. So I'm sorry, but I don't think institutions like democracy, ballot box democracy, liberal democracy, are the only ones that deliver political legitimacy to leadership. State leadership can come into being through a system of, uh, of rigorous analysis, through a system of rigorous training, of exclusion every now and then when a Bushy Lai character shows up. But there is no indication that I can see from these kinds of data that tell me that one group of people feel alienated from their leaders and the other group does not. To the extent that actually these data show any tendency, it's the opposite of what you might expect. It's not that open democracy delivers all the goods in terms of legitimacy. Now, I know I'm running out of time, so let me just finish up. The, the idea that the demographic dividend doesn't work for China or for the rest of the station. Actually, it turns out it was Chinese scholars who first identified this problem. And in early papers from early on, they identified how this grow old before you get rich problem may be stated not quite so pungently as the failure of the demographic dividend. But this grow old before you get rich problem is one that's been acknowledged and recognized. And the fact of the matter is the numbers are quite scary because very soon, China's old, the over 60, will be more than 340 million people. They will be almost the size of the United States. It will be one United States of old people sitting there in China. So these people are going to be afraid of the state. They're not working. Good gosh, what are we going to do with them? They're going to be a drag on our growth rate. Let's expand this discussion a little bit. Let's look around the world now and think about which parts of the world actually do have populations that are young and growing and ought to show a demographic activity, regardless of their political structure. Well, here's a part of the world that does show that. In, within the next 10 years, the Middle East and North Africa, the Gulf region, will need to come up with 150 million jobs for young people, many of whom are angry and alienated, and many of whom, given the structure of the natural resource curse that besets these economies, will not actually be able to find satisfying, enriching, fulfilling jobs. They will be angry. They will be an angry demographic group. So I ask myself the question, would I prefer to live, which is going to be the most stable society? A society where we've got 340 million people practicing Tai Chi in the park, or 150 million angry people clamoring for jobs that are not going to be there? It seems to me not so clear that the demographic dividend continues to work in the right way. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip this bit about capital. But let me just end this section by treating, taking again, the decoupling issue. Economists like to talk about natural experiments. So and so, something happened, and look, this is such a natural experiment. I can understand whether people's utility functions are quasi semi So here's an experiment, natural or otherwise. The world collapsed in 2008. The transatlantic axis collapsed in 2008. The West collapsed in 2008. If the East showed patterns of growth that were not sustainable, or was sustainable only because the West continued to be the engine of growth, when 2008 happened, right there was an experiment that should have shown the East collapsing. What actually happened? Well, in the five years since 2007, the IMF has collected data on GDP measured market exchange rates. GDP growth in absolute terms measured market exchange rates across different parts of the world. These are the top 10 contributors to world economic growth since 2007. Right at number one is China. China, between 2007 and 2012, generated $4.5 trillion of additional GDP. This is in nominal GDP and market exchange rates, but that's the right thing to be measuring here, because we're interested in inflation as much as we are in the output of real GDP. 
China generated an increase, contributed to the world an increment of GDP three times the size of the United States. And in fact, as you look across this picture, among the top ten contributors are the BRIC economies of Australia. The world now has indeed moved to where decoupling has occurred. So let me finish up. Go back to what Dr. Chabab said. This growth here on balance uncoordinated and unsustainable. Actually, yes, I mean not. Despite all of the advantages that economists, social scientists, observers have been able to throw at the growth of the East, along with critics, including Premier Wen himself, actually China and the rest of East Asia has shown the resilience that's remarkable. And you need to take a second to think about this as I did, because Kisho Mahubani, let me return to Kisho, who's one of the locals here. Kisho Mahubani describes how the practice of economic development is one where scholars got together, wrote papers, then they went out to try and change the world. And they found out how difficult it was. They found out how difficult it was to change the world even when you went to small economies that you could control in a very tight way. And then you reflect for a second, China and East Asia, two billion people of humanity, uncoordinated, unbalanced, and unsustainable growth patterns, not really open to democracy, not really having all the right structures of institutions that we're supposed to have in the West so that the East could become more like the West. Despite all of this, what's happened with China and the rest of East Asia has been able to continue growing. And you realize this is when small economies that have tight control with the best economists approaching them have not been able to do this. And Kishore Mangwani said, what this should make you think of is that it's like seeing, looking around you in a classroom and seeing the fattest kid in school suddenly win the marathon. It is not the case that what's happening in the East is unbalanced, uncoordinated, unsustainable. It might look like that, but it's actually turned out to be very successful. So let me conclude now, let me finish. So does the world still need this? Return to the Geelong Icon Green call to intellectuals, policymakers, scholars worldwide. Do we need to go back and endow the United States with power and willingness to take on the responsibility and burden of sacrifice? Well, given the facts that we've just gone through, we might be suspicious and say, maybe not. But that doesn't say that this shouldn't happen. It just says, maybe this is not going to happen. Maybe they don't have the capacity to do this. But the second trillion dollar question is, will the United States do the right thing if we do end up with this responsibility and worth? Because after all, with great power comes great responsibility. Will they do the right thing? And we don't know. But here's a fact, let me leave you. It is true that when we survey the world and we ask people in different parts of the world, where do you think the future of your nation lies? Where, who is it that you need to most engage with? And when Sir, the German Marshall Foundation goes around and asks Americans and Europeans what they find in the Facebook generation, in the Mark Zuckerberg, we are the smartest people around generation, in the 18 to 24 age group, 76% of Americans say that Asia is where their future it's going to be most of most of the time. In contrast to the gray line, which is about the same height of Europeans, Europeans in all age groups continue to think in relatively old ways. Americans are forward-looking, progressive, they see these changes, and the American population sees that these changes are happening. And all that seems good. So if we give the, the United States or any other global hegemon on the transatlantic axis to make the right, the, that power to write the rules of engagement, the fact that there are people in a functioning polity, in a functioning democracy, are so sensitive to what's happening in the East, this ought to move things in the right direction. But here's not so good news. When you ask, when you take the same people in the German Marshall Foundation, then ask them, do you consider the rise of Asia and the rise of China economic threat or opportunity? You've told me that your future rests with them. But do you think it's a good thing, good future or a bad future? And here's the scary thing. Double the number of Americans consider the rise of China and East Asia a threat than consider it an opportunity. So all these people who are actually the big East, they're not necessarily looking East in a friendly way. And for many of them, the East is just wrong. East is wrong because it's running surpluses that are taking our jobs. And the East has gotten to be where it's a team decides to be culpable, but not the maturity to be responsible. It's running these large trade surpluses, it's unbalancing the global economy, and the more the global economy shifts, the more dangerous the world becomes. So let me finish up. I've taken this to a discussion 
of facts that I hope people have in mind when they think about implicitly or explicitly voting in the next leader of the world. Of course, no, we're not going to do that. But through the formation of public opinion, through, the, through, through discussions, through scholarly articles, we need to form a view of this. And I've taken us through why that decision now is not as clear-cut as it was years back. And moreover, I've also gotten us to a point where not only is it not clear-cut as it was 30 years back, it might actually be clear that it's the wrong decision to hand the reins of global power back to the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
years and has actually has not changed at all in the last 50 years. It circles around a point in the um, on the Indian subcontinent, but it does not move. What that tells me is that the changes that occur here are not just due to population. But even if they were due to just population, it would still be the case that you would not want to discount the part of the great shift is East that was due to population, because it too adds up to economic power. Economic power is reflected in GDP. And that's the right calculation to look at. I don't know the answer to how much of this is due to investment or total factor of productivity. But in a way, that question is gotten at by some of the other discussions which raised issues about whether the investment-driven growth that we're seeing in East Asia is sustainable. The flip side of that is if it's not being driven by investment, it must be driven by TFP. But let me leave it as that. I don't know the answer to that. But actually, at some level of discussion here, it doesn't matter. Because we're, there are really only two issues. One is what the absolute size is, and the other is what the sustainability and by breaking it down to components, we're trying to get insight into sustainability. I, in the discussion here and in the other work that I'm doing, which I'm trying to attack sustainability in a different way than doing the decomposition. Now, the second and third questions, which have to do with uh, the nature of the hegemons that we're considering, is it real economic? Is it political? Is it driven by the military? And if we had people like Joe Nye and scholars, international relations scholars from North America here, with Hillary Clinton here, they would start talking about how the hegemon is not one just in military power or economic power, which they might denigrate as merely hard power. They would start talking about soft power. Soft power being the ability to convince other people to want the same things that you want even without holding a gun to their head, the military power, or even without buying them off, the economic power. And in configurations of soft power, most observers, Joe Nye, Hillary Clinton, and others, would say that the United States remains the central repository for soft power. And that is a fact that's not missed by Chinese political leaders. Premier Nguyen, President Hu Jintao, in the previous administrations constantly talked about how China needed to develop its soft power in tandem with the rise of China's economic might. But China has always been nuanced in how it approaches this because it constantly proclaims that its economic development should be viewed as a peaceful rise. All that China wants to do in this regard is to trade with other people improve prosperity, it has no hankering or aspirations after the kind of political leadership that the United States has shown through its soft power. Despite this, of course, they're quite happy to say, well, you know, we're going to have Confucius Institutes around the world teaching the rest of the world Chinese language and culture. We're quite happy to push forward Zhang Ziyi and others as representatives of Chinese soft power. In fact, we realize everybody does this. Korea does this. How you K-pop, girls' generation, what's that about? It's about soft power. It's about wanting to convince the rest of the world that our culture, our civilization, is not so unfriendly and it's not so necessarily something that you cannot understand. It's something that you too might want to be part of. In terms of actual military measurements, there are actually political scientists and others who've collected these data that I've been a consumer of, not a producer. And when you look at these military statistics, the consistent impression that you come away with is that no one else in the world has any claim to aspirations to its hegemony except the United States. The United States outspends its closest rivals in every dimension in military spending. There are about three dozen, maybe 45 aircraft carriers in the world today that are functional, metal-ready, 
aircraft carriers matter to these military political scientists because aircraft carriers are the only way in which a nation can project its military power. You can, you can have however many people in your standing army, but until you can move them from one part of the world to the other, you do not have the international military might that only aircraft carriers can endow. So the world now has about 45 aircraft carriers. The United States operates two-thirds of them. China has maybe one. Until a few years ago, it had zero. China has no projective military power. Its spending on the military is one-tenth that of the United States. Its standing army is about the same size. But then again, China's population is four times that of the United States. So by every dimension, China has no aspirations towards being a military hegemon. It's not consistent with its proclamation of a peaceful rise. And in fact, that's the right thing. Because the hegemony that we're talking about here, we intend to be a hegemony that's good for the world. We're not talking about a hegemony, a hegemon that's going to go out and conquer vast tracts of land. We're talking about a hegemon that keeps the rules of engagement, keeps the world peaceful, has the capacity to do that. And for them, it's not clear that any of these other dimensions is the right one. Fingers crossed, and I say policymakers, global policymakers have learned lessons 
from all this violent history that we've seen. And so we will be able to segue into a world that is more balanced, that attempts to reconcile these political and economic disparities. But right now, things don't look very good. What's happening in North Korea, the three posturing, the US response to what's happening in, in North Korea, does not seem to be moving us towards a peaceful resolution of any kind. It does not seem to be showing greater understanding of different kinds of cultures. The democracies in Northeast Asia, Japan and South Korea, you know, then all of a sudden we're suddenly confronted with two quite extreme right-wing governments put, you know, elected into power. Partly in Japan, perhaps because of the reaction to the previous government's inability to cure the economic slump. In South Korea, perhaps because of a generational link with the current president with the previous one, you know, with one several generations back. So there might be reasons for that. My colleague at LSE, Ani Weston, international history, uh, instead pushes the idea that what's happening in the democracies in Northeast Asia is actually a response to the growing might of China, China's growing belligerence in the, in the East and South China Sea. And that these governments are being elected as a way to keep the power of China in check. That would be consistent with what we see in the United States, how the United States is behaving in its pivot towards Asia. Now, all of this could be a very dangerous situation. I was on a panel with uh, Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia recently, and he told me about a book that I was reading that maybe some of you, all of you already know, called The State Orders, where the author documented how in the run-up to the First World War, the outbreak of the First World War, everybody in Western Europe thought that the world had settled into peace, that the trade, the huge amount of globalization that had occurred in the beginning of the 20th century would mean that countries would no longer go to war against one another. Tom Friedman, New York Times columnist is known for, among other things, the McDonald's epoch and theory of war. Uh, he lightheartedly proposed the idea that two nations that have McDonald's outlets in them will never go to war with each other. Now, of course, that's not uniformly true, and you know, real scholars laugh at this idea anyway. But the idea there is that with globalization, the, the germ of the more serious idea there, which Freeman himself would very quickly go on to, is that with greater economic integration and possibility for violent confrontation, many is many but we know that that's not true. We know that in the run-up in the 20th century, we know 20th century, when globalization was an order of magnitude more than we see now, that did not stop the world, the First World War, from breaking up for quite a silly, small-scale political assassination. Um, that picks up many of the points that I hope you've raised best I can. I'm happy to have discussions that expand this further. I can pick up on some of the themes that Eric asked about and perhaps push you a little bit further. Um, I think everybody saw very clearly the economic shifts that you described uh, with the data that you're using. And of course, the really tough questions are the questions that then emerge for the political meaning of those changes. And in a sense, in these questions, you, I think in these answers, you've been, you've been getting at that more and more. Uh, let me try and ask a couple of questions which get at this in two different ways. One is sort of linking the economic and the political in the following way, to ask of how much of China's success today comes from not being one of the world leaders. Meaning it's a way of saying China has been a free rider on a set of institutions that were set up at a different time, different place for different reasons, nonetheless has benefited from them <coughs> to take over as the world's leader. What kind of costs would it be willing to bear? Uh, how sustainable would it be from that point? The second is to turn to the historical question and to ask and to say that really, if we look back over the last 200 years, we've had perhaps one real transition between hegemonic leaders from the UK to the US. And one could even argue that that was a relatively easy one because that was almost within the family, kind of an Anglo-Saxon, Anglo you know, father to son, whatever the right familial metaphor is. Um, at the same time, you can't ignore the fact that that transition arguably took 20 years between the First and the Second World Wars to take place, and was accompanied by a war on a scale that we'd never seen before. If I take away one conclusion from all the things that you've said, you imply that the future is not going to be like the past. We're at a subtle point. And I think we are really unclear about what that future is going to look like. If you had to 
make a bet, and I know that's probably not how you want to say this, this, but would you see the past repeating itself one more time? Or if there's going to be a future that we don't imagine, is it going to be accompanied by war? Uh, how do you see, maybe at a kind of most metaphysical level, are we at that saddle point now? Is the past going to be like the future? Is the future going to look like the past, or are we in some entirely new game that that even all the data that you have, the time series data, in a sense, is not going to be helpful. Yeah. 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 Uh, let, me, let me quickly answer your question first, and then try to explain why I come to this. And the answer to your question is, I think it's wide open. How the world economy, how the world global society evolves from here on out is wide open. But the fact that it's wide open, I think, you know, carries the content of the surprise. Because I think, if you had asked me the same question, uh, without my trying to work through all these numbers, without my trying to understand how the change occurred, I would probably have said that the world in the next 20 years will look pretty much like the world of the last 50 years. One dominated by a global hegemon, which is the United States, with patterns of trade and finance dictated by the transatlantic access. I think it's wide open, and that's a move away from that status quo. So let me try to explain why that is. Um, correctly, you and Eric have also already made reference the last time this kind of transition happened. And that last time this kind of transition happened, remember, was in 1872 when, you know, for a long time, for the century before then, the United Kingdom had been the world's number one economy. The US rapidly caught up in 1872. It finally took that over. And then absolutely nothing happened. The world did not suddenly change around. Everybody suddenly did not stop changing their behavior. Because you know, when the transition occurs, that's actually a minute event. I know that you know when those of us who want to think about like these kinds of race for global leadership, we like to think about it as a, like an Olympics race. Who touches the ticket team? You know, who touches who presses the team first? And then it's the entire difference between silver and gold. In these kinds of large scale events, when the transition actually occurs, nobody actually notices. Nobody notices that the United States can overtake the United Kingdom until decades later. In fact, absolutely nothing changed. The world's reserve currency did not change. The world's patterns of trade did not change. Absolutely nothing changed. As both you and Eric have made reference to, what, what actually changed people's perspectives was two world wars where the United States set on the winning side of both of them. And then huge indebtedness that the rest of the global economy held relative to the United States. That's what changed people. And the United States already had a foot up in that matter because it was using the English language, its systems, its political institutions, its cultures are not that dramatically different from the United Kingdom. Whereas, when this transition occurs, if it does occur, and we look ahead in the decades to come, we're going to be looking at a world where, for the first time in maybe a thousand years, the largest economy, the world's potential leader, is non-Western, non-democratic, and non english that will be a completely different change in three different dimensions from the last time that this happened. And the last time this happened, it was still a gradual transition. Now, whether the United States actually did this in a peaceful way is, I think, perhaps more open to question. Um, other colleagues of mine, Aaron Buzan and Michael Cox in the International Relations Department at LSE, recently published a paper rather mischievously comparing China's peaceful rise today with the peaceful rise of the United States 200 years ago. And there are actually interesting parallels between the language that US political leaders used at the beginning of the birth of their state and the beginning of the modern era, which is China's modern era. Both sides actually talked about wanting to, wanting just to rise in impact. Both sides wanting a peaceful and what the United States did was it actually got embroiled in almost wars by props. Other people fought wars, and then it jumped in. And it jumped in on the winning side. China, going forwards, will not have those kinds of opportunities. If the United States asserted its global hegemony through this kind of <coughs> accidentally winning wars, not accidentally, of course, but stepping into wars after they were already fought, the other side was, was exhausted, they came in, and then they won the war and the battles. China might not have the opportunity for it. There's much less of a cluster of English-speaking democratic alliances around, you know, similar alliances around China as the United States got to enjoy. 
So pluses and minuses, but it suggests that change will be profound. What are the costs to China's uh, if China were to become world leader? And, and as Marcus and as Eric have, have said either explicitly or implicitly, there are many different dimensions to that. Marcus is very clear. It's you know it's actually it's strange coming from an economist, but almost you're almost accusing me of merely doing economics, not looking at the, you know, the military, not looking at the political power. And I sign up to exactly your objections. I think it is not sufficient to remain within mere economics. But when we look at these broader dimensions, uh, it's, a, it's a, entirely a mixed bag. The United States, one can argue, has benefited hugely from its position as world leader. We all subscribe to the United States soft power makes us all want to be like the United States. We all want to be American. We want to, you know, I travel around the world, I give talks, I talk to students about you know, this diversification of economic power. Many undergraduates in all different parts of the world, they come up to me after the talk, the first question they ask is, how do I get into graduate school in the United States? That's what they want to know. They want to go to the United States. Despite hearing just two hours of argument against why the United States is not necessarily the center of the, the universe. First question is, how do I get to graduate school in the US? Uh, the United States has this immense attraction, this soft power that will be sustained for decades, if not centuries. It has benefited hugely from this. The advancement in science and research and development and technology has come from a strong body of inflow of human capital and talent from the rest of the world. No one would stand up and say the US technological progress has come simply from domestic science. It has not. And there's an interesting lesson here for Singapore as it continues to struggle with its attitude towards foreign workers. The United States has benefited from being an open economy. Able to continue to grow, attract people, you know, accumulate soft power precisely because it's open to ideas and to people. Singapore needs to be like that too. Um, the, what are, so the other huge advantage the United States has gotten is of course that it issues the world's reserve currency. And in doing that, economists, you know, though have documented how by issuing the world's reserve currency, you immediately have a pool that is deep for your borrowing from the rest of the world. It shifts risk from your consumers to foreign producers. It allows you to take different kinds of financial actions which the rest of the world does not have access to. When Moody's and Fritch's and other financial ratings agencies downgrade U.S. debt, what, does the, what do international financial markets do? You think a downgrading of debt, hmm, I better get out of the U.S. dollar, invest in Australian dollars or something else. No, they pile into U.S. dollars. They begin, they begin to lend even more to the U.S. government. When U.S. currency, when U.S. government debt gets downgraded, why? Because it's the world's reserve currency. And this is why people in the United States, policymakers in the United States, you know, Fiscal cliff, what fiscal cliff? The rest of the world is always ready to lend to us as much as we wish. Now, the rest of the world, outside of Europe, outside the European Union, the Eurozone has not had need to pull, pull up that kind of channel. But you can imagine at some point in the future, other parts of the world might want to do that, and they won't be able to, because it'll be still the US dollar as the world's reserve So if I were China, and we're looking at this range of costs and benefits, I would say, you know, if I were to become the world leader tomorrow because everybody decided, 7 billion people have decided I should be a world leader rather than the United States, I would probably shrug my shoulders and say, oh, okay. I wouldn't object. I wouldn't fight for it, but I wouldn't object. But the costs of you talked about the benefits. Yeah, I think the costs are minimal. Think about that being the possibility of a transition, not just from unipolarity, 
U.S. was clearly the global engine, to potentially what no doubt would be what is called the G2 configuration of uh, bipolarity, which is the terrible thing to lose, right? you know, bipolarity where there might be two multiple, two or more poles. And the European Union obviously was hoping that it would emerge as one of those poles until we discovered the weaknesses in the, the single currency and the differential performance across the different parts of the European Union. But this does leave open the possibility that multiple poles will still emerge in the world. There's no logical or natural necessity that the world be characterized by just a single of two poles. Because, and I say this fully acknowledging that there are colleagues of mine, Peter Tennant, David Vines, Barry Evan Green, and Brett Along, and others, who think that not only do we need to get away from the multipolarity world, we shouldn't even try and flirt with the bipolar world. We should go back to a single global legend. <coughs> Actually, I would like to go even further than you. I would like us to eventually move to a system of global governance that attempts to see through the artifact that is the nation state, but just drill down to what people actually want. Anyone else? Yes. Circumspect 
or these richer type of proposals that I don't yet see how these richer proposals uh, intend to solve this global public goods problem. What the proposal is. It's true that there will be power sharing, everyone will feel better about the world, we'll all be part of a better integrated political structure. And that's part of what we should be striving for. But the other part of that is that we still need global governance and the provision of global governance. And that is efficiently and speedily done for the time being, the way we think about it now, for a single provider, single global government. That doesn't mean that we can't figure out some other way to do it. I just don't see that, how we're going to do that. But it's good that the BRIC countries are engaging in discussion to try and provide that. If China were to become a global hegemon, actually this goes back to one of your questions, so it should, maybe I should try and then flesh out a little bit more. If China does become a global leader, would it be a peace world? What, you know, what are the tensions and challenges that China would itself come under? So I, I don't think of it as what are the costs or what are the problems that China will need to solve, which is actually your, your question I have misinterpreted. That, you know, there's no logical reason why we would expect any single party to continue to play peaceful even if they have been playing this world for the last several millennia. It is not something that we can try and, and, and investigate in terms of the history or the psychology of civilization or culture. When China is the world leader, it will be faced with challenges from uh, that come from disruptions in Africa, in the Gulf region, with 150 million people who are not practicing Tai Chi in the park. You know, you will have to deal with these global issues the same way that the United States now does. It's got to figure out ways to deal with them. And I don't think it's got a good idea about how to do it. But I don't think the United States did either 200 years ago. Is there something you broke into? So, I, I don't know. Now, when, I, when no one's world, which really is no one's world, why are we worried about managing it? Of course, saying that it's no one's world is actually a cheeky way of saying it's everyone's world. It's not that it's no one's world, it's everyone's world. It's just that it's not the American world, not the Chinese world, it's everyone's world. That's why we should all be concerned about how we manage. Just seeing if anybody has one. Okay. Let's try and get two questions in. Try and make them short. We've gone over the time. Why don't you get that in? Uh, I'm Daniel from AS Business School, and uh, I have one question. Is actually recently uh, the newly elected uh, president of China, uh, Xi Jinping, has just visited Russia and uh, Brazil, and he's actually uh, proposing uh, something called a BRIC bank to potentially overtake the World Bank. So my question is, do you think this can be possible? And if so, when can this happen? And to extend on this question is uh, adding on to Sebastian's point about power sharing. Um, uh, multipolarity of the world. If something like a brick bank should happen, will we see problems like EU is facing, whereby they are having a problem with a single currency? Will we see such problem whereby different powers are sharing to support such a bank? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Just wondering, if, just wondering if you have done any research looking at the relationship uh, between equity premium and uh, the certainty of hegemony. Okay. And yeah, it just seems, seems like a, a very interesting Excellent. question. Very good. And in fact, okay. Okay. Uh, the, the equity premium is, the, I hope it's the same terminology that I have in mind that you're using. Something that people in finance and economics 
other people who argue that actually the equity premium has gone away. But let's put that to one side. Your question was about flourishing of political developments and equity premium. So there are just those two pieces of literature that I might suggest to you. On Danielle's question, um, Xi Jinping had, of course, you know, as, as you say, that there's been the, this worldwide BRICS conference, and part of the discussion there, not the only discussion, but part of the discussion there, has to do with the development of the BRICS Bank. Uh, and there are different forms in which this might take. You related it to the Eurozone and the single currency and other such developments. I mean, one possible path, uh, all of this is up in the air, all of this is nebulous still, and its developments will emerge. But part of the reading on that discussion is that you know, the idea for a BRICS Bank is not that it will try and, and replicate what the European Central Bank does with a single currency, but instead it might be some cooperation between what the World Bank in Washington DC does and what the IMF in Washington DC does. In other words, it would be an international financial institution that paid attention to what a narrower set of clients were interested in, a narrow set of clients and stakeholders were interested in. And part of the dissatisfaction there with the IMF and the World Bank is well justified. We think about what happened in the 1997 Asian financial crisis. And we learned, and we look back at that history, and we realized how the IMF preached a gospel of fiscal austerity onto economies that were in free fall. And what happened with these economies is that you know, unemployment rose by tens if not hundreds of millions, stock markets plummeted, exchange rates fell dramatically. It was a difficult time for Asia in general to come through. And in the popular perception, the IMF basically said, you fix it. You come up with the financial resources to fix it. We're not going to help you. Okay. So that's what happened in the past. And then part of the development of this idea that there ought to be a bridge back is the perception that, well, you know, uh, the IMF is dominated by Europeans at the executive level, almost by an unreached consensus. And look how the IMF is approaching a similar financial crisis in Europe. It's attempting to put together a financial package after financial package to help them. This seems to be quite a difference in approaches and attitudes. Maybe the, you know, the generous interpretation is that the IMF learns its lesson from 1997. It's trying not to reproduce that behavior. The more cynical perception is the IMF is in hawk to a collection of stakeholders which is narrowly defined sitting around the transatlantic axis. And until we break that, we will never be able to get the same kind of satisfaction from them. So why not we build our own? And indeed, the IMF does not help when today it preaches a line that says, you know, part of the cause of the global financial crisis was Asian economies saving too much. Asian economies saved too much, they generated large trade surplus, that generated net capital outflow into Western financial markets. That was the fuel for how investment bankers then behave. You are all saving too much. Saving too much relative to precautionary savings. Whereas a reasonable response to that observation is, well, gosh, the reason we're saving so much is that the last time we needed financial resources, we were left on our own. So maybe it's right that we save so much. And, but everybody recognizes that saving so much in a precautionary savings way is probably excessive self-insurance. Anything that we can help to diversify that away through possibly a regionally focused or <coughs> stakeholder focused bridge bank would help. But then the benefits to that come from a mixture of a development institution like the World Bank and a financial institution like the IMF, not the European Central Bank. And I think there's a lot of virtue to but whether that would actually happen is entirely up in the air. I think the way I read the discussions going, there are no concrete plans beyond just the mouthing of statements that say it would be a good idea. Without actually as much detail as, I, as, as we've gone into in this discussion. Thank you, Professor Kwa. I was hoping we were going to end on an optimistic note because the BRICS Bank is in fact the kind of new institution when we talk to global governance that possibly we could see more and more emerging, not coming from one country or a hegemon, but rather from a co coalition of countries from across the world. But if you say, really, we don't know much about how it's going to happen and what's going to take place, we're unfortunately left with a slightly more pessimistic message that I think came through very clearly. Not one that I think we, means that we should all go away feeling depressed, but simply one that says that the future is going to be quite uncertain and we don't know exactly where it's going. I think we know where the economic trends are taking us. I think the political questions are one that are still very much up in the air and that I hope 
a number of young people sitting in this room will take to heart and because you're going to have to solve these problems, none of us are going to be here. Thank you very much, Professor Court.